Great. Welcome to Last That News, take a top stories in crypto, break it down to bite-sized pieces, all that good stuff. So today, uh, we're going to go over just a couple of uh, news items that have uh, piqued my fancy as far as what is going on. And we're going to talk about how uh, China somehow is back into the Bitcoin mining game. And just so you know, uh, there will be a ban uh, happening in uh, very quickly, I'd like I say, three, two, one. Here comes a ban from China. So don't be concerned. This is very normal. I also want to take a look at uh, some concerning consumer data, especially with uh, we see that there's an economic downturn and potentially a recession in the future. And also we'll talk about how stablecoin regulation is uh, heating up. We've got the Celsius CEO, which we had on yesterday, Alex Mashinsky, and uh, his thoughts on that. We'll go over that quickly. And then also uh, how there is uh, Congress is being uh, asked to actually do something for once about it, and we'll go over all that. And then at the very end, we'll do a Q&A. So hold your questions until the end. So first of all, thanks for stopping by for the uh, live stream. I appreciate it. Just so you know, we'll have timestamps uh, below so you can skip around to where you want to because time is valuable, but it just makes sense to go all the way through. But uh, what we want to do real quick is take a look at a little market recap. So I got to tell you, not that I'm shocked at... Uh, you know, just the sideways action, except for Ethereum, man, 8.6% in the last seven days, but again, up 1.1. Again, it's very choppy sideways. So if you're a trader, this is a pretty good time. A little bit of chop sideways, a little bit, little tiny uh, inferences back and forth. But what was surprising to me is when I was getting this, this video done or actually set up, see where it says right here, the global, uh, the global crypto market is 1.35 trillion, a 1.1% increase. Just an hour ago, it said 1.8%. And when I take a look at the S&P 500, uh, this was just going straight up. And uh, it was looking pretty good. And the same thing was happening with NASDAQ. But uh, as you can see, as this goes down, and also S&P goes down slightly, so do we slightly. So we went from 1.1% to 1, or 1.8% to 1.1. So uh, it's very closely correlated in my humble opinion. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section, but that is what it is. So that's the basics of what's going on in the market. Kind of boring, I must, I must say, but the boring times, I have to tell you, is where I made all my money. And that leads me to my next point, because I don't know how long you've been here in this space. If you've been here since 2011 or 15 or 17 like me or in 2022. I just have to bring this up to your attention because so you know exactly what's going to happen in the future. Now, I have no crystal ball. I have no idea exactly if this is definitely going to happen. But if history is any, any teacher, it's going to. And there's a uh, pretty famous meme that I like to always bring up, which is the China ban. The China ban uh, for Bitcoin is pretty prevalent and it happens all the time. So we're gonna take a look at a story which miraculously shows that uh, Bitcoin miners from China have uh, increased by you know 20% in a very short amount of time. So, but just so you know, as Bitcoin becomes more used or Bitcoin miners come out, or maybe even there's some more trade in China, uh, there at some point will be another China Bitcoin ban. And it will be all over uh, CNBC and MSNBC, and it will cause fear to people to say, wow, uh, this economic superpower that is China has just banned Bitcoin, so it's all gonna go down the tubes. And if you've been here for any length of time, you know uh, how ridiculous that is because it happens all the time. But it's a good opportunity to let the people who are unaware start to sell because they get scared and you just sit on the sidelines and just go, hmm, I'll just wait for this to maybe have an opportunity for myself. That's not investment advice, just investment opinion. And it's what I will be doing when that eventual ban does come into play. So it all comes down to this story on, uh, on a multiple publications, but this is from uh, Yahoo Finance. And it states uh, China may have massive underground Bitcoin mining despite a ban last year. And this is what we have. So there's data from the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance on Tuesday. And we're gonna take a look at that in a second because I don't think this data is lining up from this information and where they pulled it, but sure. It states uh, from last September to January, traffic from China accounted for about 20% of Bitcoin's total hash rate, 20%. 
And of course, uh, in 2017, 16, 15, it was uh, massive. I, I'm pretty sure it was over 50%. And there was a big uproar about uh, decentralization. Is And was Bitcoin truly decentralized if, if one country was doing all the mining? Now, of course, I've learned some things along the way. And I understand it that uh, if you're a Bitcoin miner, you can plug into any pool that you want to, uh, wherever you are from. If you're from New Jersey or something, or Australia, you can uh, you, you could have uh, put into any of those uh, Bitcoin mining pools in China, but you could have just as easily uh, pulled the plug and done one in uh, you know the United States or Canada or wherever else it was. So it's not like back in the day it was just solely China, but there was a lot of data mining uh, pools there. Uh, it just depends on how many um, actual Bitcoin miners. So anyhow. China recovered quickly last year after the ban after showing virtually no activity from China in August. It was back up to 22.3% of the Bitcoin hash rate the following month. It's pretty fast. Uh, and the, the question that I had is, well, how'd that happen? Because if, if China, if you know, the communist, the CCP, China Communist Party comes in and says, look, uh, you can't do that. We're going to ban it all. We're going to shut off the electricity. Uh, you can't mine bitcoin you can't do anything with bitcoin you can do anything with the digital yuan which is on blockchain but it's all centralized but nothing with bitcoin so the question was well how the heck did they do that so fast and this is what it states access to off-grid electricity and geographically scattered small-scale operations among the major means used by underground miners to hide their operations from authorities and circumvent the ban and if you want to just take a look uh as far as like just how powerful china was as far as the hash rate this was a pretty good indicator. Back in 2019, it was like, if I'm looking at this right, about 75%. Holy smokes. And then, of course, it just dwindled. And there was a China ban um, in June or so of 2021. And then there was really nothing. And then here we are yet again with China doing their thing. So, again, it comes down to how they're doing this. Uh, this is from a uh, data service. They said miners in, Cho in China use a VPN and try not to use too much energy from a single spot so the electrical company cannot detect any strange energy consumption. I found that interesting, that if you're using a, uh, a VPN connection, it, I believe it, it hides your IP address. Uh, I think that's how it works. And then if we take a look at the data that they pulled this from, this is the, the Cambridge Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index. Here's the visual, visualization. Unfortunately, for this one, it only goes December 2021. You can uh, do whatever data points you want. Uh, but, you know, you can see here, US, pretty good. A lot of uh, Bitcoin mining going on, M mostly or a large part in Texas. I, uh, th I, that's my state that I live in right now, but I usually live in Puerto Rico for a uh, majority of the year. So that's good. And then, of course, you got Florida, zero points. Not too much. This was surprising to me. California, almost 8%. And this was even uh, more surprising, Georgia. Georgia, 30% average monthly hash rate, November 21. And we hear all these stories about Texas, but I guess not. And then, of course, there's also a big one in New York and then also uh, Kentucky, sure, 11%. Then we take a look at uh, mainland China. Of course, there's uh, Big Huge in Xinjiang. And what's this one right here? Uh, Sichuan, nailed it. But the, the, the question that I had was, how, are they, how do they pull this? And they said right here, data collection. We partnered, well, this up. we partnered with several Bitcoin mining pools to collect geolocational mining facility data in a non-obtrusive and privacy-preserving manner. This geolocational data is based on IP addresses of mining facility operators or hashers that connect the servers of mining pools. So again, uh, if they're using VPNs, not for sure how that worked, but that's the data uh, that we have. So there's that part. And again, just so you know, uh, just because that uh, there is this, this mining operation going on in China, of course, you will see uh, a ban uh, eminent at some point in the very near future. But uh, I will say that Bitcoin mining, and the reason why I bring this up is because Bitcoin mining itself, you can look at it in a couple of different ways. Uh, you can look at it as uh, securing the network, you can look at it as, you know, corporations just uh, feeding the bottom line. But for me, what I look at this, I look at this as job creation. And uh, if you're not from the United States, uh, we are in the uh, midterm year. So in November, we're going to be voting. 
and we'll see uh, who actually keeps their job as far as uh, Congress and Senate. And uh, I will say that uh, job creation and uh, the economy is the number one, at least one of the ma major ones that, that uh, all these politicians are looking at and trying to make favorable to their constituents. And when I see stuff like this, I'm like, this is great job creation. So if you can have a state where you're bringing a lot of people, I think that's what people will actually vote for and go, we want to be a part of that. And Texas is no different. What happened just today, or actually report from yesterday, uh, Texas Pacific uh, is one of the largest landowners in Texas, and they've partnered with a digital infrastructure provider, uh, which is known as uh, J Energy, and they're going to be creating a Bitcoin mining operation in West Texas, where I live. So it states right here, Texas Pacific Land Corp, one of the largest landowners in Texas, Moss Infrastructure Group, and J Energy have partnered to build up 60 megawatts of Bitcoin mining capacity in West Texas. And this was what was surprising to me. Construction is expected to begin within the second quarter of 2022, which is, that's right now. And within, for functionality, they're not expected to be functional until the fourth quarter of 2020. That's very fast. That's way faster than, than Congress can move. And uh, I just, again, I look at this and I go, this is just one of the many things of, of why when people say, ah, crypto is going to go away and you know, it's, it's going to go to zero. No, it's not. It's not. Because of things like this, and of course, they can tax those operations. They can tax uh, the land that they're actually put, built it on. And uh, they can also tax the capital gains that uh, you and I share. So... When we talk about these things going away, I don't think so. Also, this was a story we covered a couple, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Fort Worth is the first city in the U.S. to mine Bitcoin, and they're doing it at a city hall. They got three Bitcoin at miner S9 mining rigs that run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and a climate-controlled uh, IT wing of Fort Worth City Hall. So again, when I take a look at this, I think to myself, man, if we see where things are going, I think it's actually the future is pretty bright. Just right now looks a little bit uh, bleak because of where we're at. But again, uh, bear markets, bull markets, all the money that I've ever made in crypto or the majority has been when I have accumulated slowly and just dollar cost average. And just so you know, I was dollar cost averaging Luna uh, when it collapsed. But thankfully, I didn't put a big bunch of money into it because we never know. And uh, that's, for me, I think it's the safest option over time things kind of work out. And I lost thousands of dollars and at least it wasn't life savings like uh, the things that I've heard. So if that's you, I'm sorry to hear that. Anyhow, let me just think about that in the comments section and let's finish up. Actually, we're going pretty quick today. Uh, consumer data. So this was a little piece from Charlie Baleo. If you don't know this gentleman, he is the CEO of Compound Capital. Always has the greatest stuff. So if you're if you're on Twitter, give this guy a follow. He's always got uh, great information that's happening. And he says, "How is U.S. consumer spending still so strong despite inflation outpacing wage for 13 months? Americans are saving less, with the savings rate moving to 6.2 percent. So that you can take a look at this as either positive or negative. So the savings in America." 6.2%, right? That's the lowest uh, it's been since 2013, it looks like. So the question that I have is, uh, first of all, if people aren't saving, then what are they doing? Maybe people are investing. I hope. Maybe they're, they've, the majority of people have figured it out. Like, hey, if I just save this money, it just gets inflated away anyhow. So maybe I should put it into, I don't know, maybe some stocks, even though we're overinflated. Maybe some real estate, even though that's overinflated. Or maybe some distressed assets like in crypto, hopefully. I don't think that actually is the case. And this has actually come down to here where I think there's a bigger problem brewing. And Charlie says uh, they are also borrowing at an increasing rate to maintain their current standard of living. So uh, these people, they're not saving because they don't only really have money to save. I think because of the CPI, PPI numbers and inflation rate, uh, people have to actually buy the same goods, the milks, the eggs, gas, uh, and the rages aren't matching up with the inflation and the different prices that are out there. So they're not savings. They're not saving because they don't have the money to save. And then what are they doing here? They're also borrowing at an increased rate. U.S. consumer credit rose 7.3% over the last year. 
the highest rate of increase in over a decade. So if you put these two together, it's a little concerning. You don't, you can't save, you need to buy some things. You don't have the money. So you take it on credit, credit cards, whatever your interest rate is. And, uh, consumer credit rose. I mean, you can see right now it's the highest it's been in uh, a decade. So those are just some concerning numbers. We'll see how it all plays out. I'm sure you think about that. And let's finish up with everybody's least favorite topic. <laughs> sorry, sorry to say that, but it's true. Uh, regulation. And um, if you've been on the channel any length of time, you know my stance. I just think we need to be adults in the room and just say, let's get it over with. You're going to do it anyhow. So let's just give us the rules so we know we can bend. We know we can win. And when we're talking about these institutional investors coming in, you have to understand, uh, there's, and James talks about this on Best Answers a lot, where he's like, there's a wall of money coming in. There's a wall of money. There's a mass amount of money coming in. And I agree with him. There is. The problem is these institutions, they are risk sometimes, not all the time, but a lot of times they are risk aversive. And they don't want to put their money into something that uh, can just you know, evaporate away. Take a look at Luna. So I think a lot of them want to see a little regulation before they can say, you know what? The stock market is overinflated. We can't put it into real estate. Bonds are a joke. Maybe there's a great asymmetrical bet. We can put it into crypto. And guess what? There's a little regulation to put us in there. But there's a flip side to all that. And the flip side to all that is what we just talked about here with the NASDAQ. They will treat us, these institutions, I believe, like a redheaded stepchild for quite some time because they will look at us as just that plaything where there's, there's an asymmetrical bet. The real smart ones will get it and they'll see the future like a Michael Saylor, like a Bill Miller, like a Paul Tudor Jones. They'll get it. But a lot of these institutions will look at this and go, you know what, this is, this is just us, the ability to get rich. And you see it right now. Uh, they invest into it. We've got a 1.3 trillion market cap, which is paltry compared to everything else. I mean, for Pete's sakes, gold is 12 trillion. The stock market is 286 trillion. Uh, real estate is 387 trillion and derivatives is over a quadrillion. So 1.3 trillion market cap is as peanuts to these guys. So when they get into this, I don't think they're really going to treat it like a serious asset. Only the smart ones will, which is why we need regulation just a little bit. And I know you're going to sound off in the comment section. Go right ahead. I've taken the shelves, <laughs> the shelves before. <laughs> That's just how it is. So this comes down to uh, this is uh, U.S. Rep. Josh uh, Gottheimer, uh, Democrat, New Jersey. And he's no slouch. He's on the uh, blockchain committee. And it's about four minutes or so. And he's going to talk about stablecoin regulation. And you're going to hear the frustration in these people's voices because Congress can't get things done. They can't get things done because they're dragging their feet. I'm going to let you talk about why that actually is in the comment section. But this is the exact same thing that me and Alex Mashinsky from Celsius were talking about. Alex is not a big regulation guy obviously with Celsius. But when we talked about, and I linked this video in the description, Alex, even Alex Mashinsky was like, listen, man, we need regulation for stable coins. This is ridiculous. I mean, he didn't say it in those exact words, but he did say, yeah, we need, we need regulation. He totally agreed with me. I was like, holy smokes, can't believe that actually happened. So take a listen to this, uh, hear the frustration. And then also when you're watching this from, this is uh, Squawk Box, it's amazing to me that in 2020, we're in 2022 right now, 2022, <laughs> that we have so much coverage of crypto and where things are going. It, it is amazing to me because in 2017, when I got in, none of this stuff was on. It was all a joke in all honesty. So hold on, let me, let me stop the screen real quick. Oh, I wish StreamYard would fix this part. That's okay. And let me share my tab so you can hear it. I'm gonna play this, I'm gonna mute myself. It's about three and a half minutes or so, but just listen to this, pretty interesting. It was so concerning because it was such a quick drop and because it seemed to have so many implications for other areas of the markets. It seemed like people had to sell some of their winners in other places to pay for things, but maybe they were long on margin and that's what's causing concern. Where, where is the regulatory perspective at this point? I mean, I think you're exactly right. What was very concerning about last week with Terror and Tether and others was the quick run on the market. And what many of us have been concerned about and, uh, and working, frankly, with, with those in the space, um, you know, innovators and entrepreneurs, is 
How do we give some more certainty to the marketplace and ensure that when you have a stable coin, it's actually qualified? And that's what my, my legislation I'm working on does. It says it should actually be backed by U.S. dollars or equivalents so you know what's behind your stable coin. And, you know, there, so it prevents runs on the marketplace and that consumers who are in the space don't suddenly find themselves with nothing uh, in, in a matter of seconds. And, and that's, that's been our issue. Our legislation actually says it either can be banked or non-banked, if you want, as a, as a cryptocurrency to define yourself as a stable coin. But to be qualified, you actually have to be backed by one-to-one -one by the U.S. currency. And uh, it also defines the regulator as the OCC. Right now, you know, there's great uncertainty, actually, who oversees the space. It's causing a mass exodus of of companies out of the United States to other countries or the, they're founding, they're laying, laying ground for their new companies in Bermuda and Bahamas or, or France and not in the United States. We want to make sure that we uh, have this market, that the jobs are here, that the innovation is here. But I think that we, it requires legislation. That's what exactly what we're working on. Josh, which, which of the stable coins actually would qualify under the constraints that you've laid out in this legislation? I mean, it was a surprise to see Tether under so much pressure last week because it was supposed to be the biggest and the most reliable? Well, there are several, as you know, that are actually backed. But part, part of the concern right now um, is that, that it's unclear, even as you know, uh, it's, uh, Tether claims has claimed that they're actually backed, but it's unclear what they're backed by, how much is by U.S. currency versus uh, an equivalence versus, uh, versus not. So I think that's exactly the kind of requirement we need to put forward. And for people to be qualified and to give people that certainty if they want to be a stable coin, that that's how they're going to define themselves. And, and they're going to actually have to show uh, their investors uh, where those resources are. You know, it, it's crazy right now that you could actually develop a, a stable coin and, and not, not be backed by anything. Um, and then people go into it and suddenly, you know, they, they read these websites. I hear from my constituents all the time about it. They, the website says, don't worry if there's a problem, it's insured. And then suddenly they have a problem. There's some theft. We know there's been hacking, there's been terror issues, and, and there's literally nothing there uh, to actually protect them. So those are the kind of things we got to be vigilant on to make sure innovation can happen, protect consumers, but also allow the space to grow and flourish. It's very right. exciting. And uh, we want to make sure we've got, though, we're, we've got the poll position. I don't it. understand this. We've had two presidents working, uh, have working group papers on this issue uh, starting back as, as early as December 2020. Why is this taking so long? What is happening? Where, where, where are you? Where I'm is with, the FTC? Uh, uh, yeah, where I'm, is I'm, the SEC? Uh, I mean, come on. Well, as you know, I don't speak for the SEC or the CFTC. Uh, I've been pushing them to actually come out with some rules of the road here, right? And the executive action, the president's executive action took steps. But the reason why we're working on this, and I'm working with not just Democrats, but Republicans, we've been taking a, a ton of input and hope to put out our, our drop our legislation. The draft is out there. You can find it on my website right now. But when we're going to officially put it out, we've got to pass this thing. And part of what's been very frustrating is, and you know how this is, right, that, that people actually don't, they're looking for every excuse not to do something. I'm saying is we have no time here. We cannot wait. We need to give this certainty uh, to prevent exactly what happened last week. Yeah, so there you go. And uh, hopefully, let me stop that. Hopefully he's right. You know, hopefully they can get something going. But we both know, uh, excuse me, when we both, like, I'm, yeah, we both know, me and you. We both know that uh, Congress is going to drag their feet. And it's not like Gary Gensler. I think Beardy Day said it pretty funny. He goes, protect me harder, Gary. We know that they're going to drag their feet because if they give, this is my personal opinion. If they give us regulate, they give us clarity. They say, this is a currency. OCC deals with that. This is a commodity. CFTC deals with that. This is a security. SEC deals with that. And also, if you want to be a stable coin, we're going to do uh, intermittent audits to make sure that you're not some fly by night operation and it's going to collapse. You're going to have to have it back to something, which is why USDC is uh, you know, on the forefront. I think if you can just get that, just get those simple things in place, it'll open up a whole new spectrum of people going to actually come in here and invest. This is just my thing. Uh, this is just the, the, the things that I think about. Let me know what you think in the comment section. And then uh, that is uh, ba, 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 essentially it for today. I will, say, I will en end up with this, uh, which is it's, I am, what I'm doing here for myself is just not investment advice, investment pain, right? Dollar cost average. I just do that every single day. And uh, if there's a huge, enormous dip, then, it's, then at some point I will actually buy up those dips. I'm done buying every single dip. Even though people say, you got to buy every dip. I'm like, ugh, maybe. 
So I just dollar cost average. And what I'm dollar cost averaging today is Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's the safest thing right now. And I'm waiting for, for bottoms or I'm waiting for some kind of verification. I don't know where it is. So that's what I'm doing. But for people out there who are like, where do I park my money? And I think this is a, a bigger thing that you have to wanna, might want to think about. It's always about where do I want to park my money? Because we know that stocks are overinflated. And the reason why they're overinflated is because the Federal Reserve bought all those ETFs and all the money printing. The bonds are not a great place. And don't even get me started with uh, real estate. I mean, that is like super overinflated right now. Even the prices are going down because interest rates are going up, which is great. Uh, so the question then is, where do you park your money? You can just park it here. That's fine. But for some of you, this is what I've been doing. 5% of my portfolio, there's this thing. It's called artwork. <laughs> And I do this thing called Masterworks. And I wanted just to point this out to you one thing. This was on 13th of May, 2022. Let me show it to you. Do you know that as bad as the market has been, choppy and sideways, do you know that uh, over at Christie's, there was a, they've exceeded a billion dollar in sales of art? You know why? Because rich people don't really care that much about the economy itself. If they want an art piece like Andy Warhol and uh, Marilyn Monroe painting, they're going to pay for it. And that's why I put 5% as a little hedge uh, with Masterworks. 400,000 investors, access to exclusive blue chip on investments. They're getting at 14.3%, which, which outstrips inflation, just so you know. Link in the description looks just like this. And just so you know, it's an affiliate link. So if you can't stand me or using affiliate links, don't use it. Just go right to Masterworks. Try to skip the wait line and just check it out. When I did, when I went through it, they just set me up. I talked to somebody for 30 minutes and they said, what's your goals? And I told them what my goals are. I'm like, that's different from the last person. So we'll taper with this. And uh, that's how it all works. So yes, a little shilling, but uh, you know what? A little shilling never hurt anybody. And that's why, well, you know, because I'm this. C -c 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 of the shill. All right, that's it. So look, that's it for today's video. So if you liked today's uh, video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing and all that good stuff. You got to go, take off. Time is precious. Let's go over a little Q&A. This ought to be interesting <laughs> after that after that regulation comments. All right. Let me put this down. Banners there, just so I can tape it in. Okay, first of all, ah, Modern Samurai. I haven't seen this guy. Hey, I haven't seen you in a while, man. Uh, no comment about the pink salmon shirt. That's fine. Slow study, Ada won the race. I think so. Why not? Cardano is the only one that's been 100% uptime forever. And just that they're a little bit slow, but uh, I think we see that uh, how slow is actually good sometimes. <laughs> King of the Shill, it's funny. Okay, here's the one that I saw. God dang, this was funny, Beardy. Protect me harder, Gary. Hey, whatever. Uh... <laughs> Jack says, whoop, whoop, more regulations than almost nobody. I know, nobody's, believe me, in this space, I am a black sheep, uh, just by bringing up that word regulation. We'll see, maybe I'm totally wrong, but uh, I think it's good for institutions. But again, even when institutions come in, it's not good, like I talked about, but I had a stepchild, a lot of stuff. Uh, Connie, got a great question. Uh, Rob, yesterday, Alex, Alex Mashinsky from Celsius, he said he deserved a badge of honor for taking said coins out of said protocol. He's talking about Luna, I suppose, and save the day. How did he save the day when I lost all my money when UST depegged? I don't know if he was talking about that or if he was talking about he's had a little argument with Bitcoin Maxis, and it's a pretty good video. Uh, I linked it in the description. Watch, uh, go ahead and check it out. And what he, I thought he was talking about was he was com he was comparing the the this gentleman from from swan bitcoin and said look we are actually helping out people who don't know how to custody their bitcoin and because of you guys saying to custody everything 30 percent of bitcoin has been lost because people lose their keys and whatever else so i had to give him a little pushback i'm like oh, come on now uh, I, I think most people can actually do that but some people cannot and i gave my example who that is so i think maybe he's talking about that but yeah uh, I have heard of instances of UST and Luna not being off uh, the exchanges fast enough because they couldn't get it out there for the transaction time frame. I don't know what to tell you on that one. It's a, it's a bad situation. And, you know, there's two, two, two ways to look at it. And um, I think it, it's, it's hard either way because some people 
not me. But some people will say, well, all these people should lose all their money because they didn't do their own research. They didn't get really into it. And then and they, they lost it all. I personally don't think that's that's the case. I think there's a lot of smart people who were talking about Luna and how great it was. And uh, if even they like, let's th take a look at it. Do you think do you, do you think Mike Novogratz did his own research? You think his team at Galaxy Digital were like, let's well, just invest into it. Sounds decent. I guarantee they did a lot of uh, research and there's things that uh, they missed. And I think we all missed. And now here we are. And then the other way is uh, we take a look at it and go, maybe we should never, you know, if you're a Bitcoin maxi, they always talk about it's an S coin. Anyway, you shouldn't have, uh, invest into it. I personally think that uh, it could have been a great thing. But if you look at the history of Do Kwan, this is one thing that nobody knew until later, which Do Kwan founder of Terra Luna, he had actually tried to do an algorithmically stable coin before and it failed miserably. And he tried it again and it failed miserably. So when we take a look at those things, it's just, how are you going to know that? I don't know. Anyhow, uh, Global Traveler to everyone here near the bottom, we're going to make it. People think it's, it's, we're at the bottom already and we're going up. Alex Machines, he says he thinks the bottom's 25K and that's where it bounced off of. I, I have no idea. And to me, um, I'm never going to time the bottom. I'm not that smart. I'm never going to time the top. But it's, it's like actually Baron Rothschild said that. One of the, one of the Rothschild. They said, uh, Rothschild, they said, he said, I made all my money by never selling the top and never buying the bottom. Meaning as smart as they were and as much influence and insider information they had, they still couldn't time the tops or the bottoms. I don't think you ever will either. Unless you know something, then contact me directly. But I think it's just, for me, that's why I dollar cost average every single day by Bitcoin, Ethereum. And uh, as time goes on, I think, well, I'll, I'll be okay. I can't tell you what to do. So that's it. And um, let me see. What else did I miss? Algo is the only algorithmic stable. Anthony Scaramucci seems to think so. He put a quarter of a billion dollars into it from Bridge Capital. So we'll see. Uh... Let me, I'll get to you in a second. Sorry. Fishbulb says, I think the bottom is 12 to 20. Let me ask you guys a question. When you see those 12 to 20, like I've seen 8,000 is the bottom. When you see those things, does it make you scared or do you get heart palpitations or do you like bring it on? Because I'm going to buy that at $8,000. That's the bigger question. And I think that's because we talk about this every time, like, um, my bottom for me, I bought Bitcoin at 6,500. So uh, it's, it's not so much of a big thing. Even if it goes down, I'm like, well, you know, it is what it is. I'll probably still buy it because I still believe in it. The question then is, you know, how, when did you get in? And um, at some point, you who are watching this, if you got in 2021 or 2022, you're going to be just like me. And they're going to be in 2026. Uh, you're going to be sitting there going, ah, look at these people who got in 2025. I know how scared you are because I was the same way. And it's, it's just, it's just, uh, it just repeats. Just like that China story, it just repeats again, and again, and again. It's just all cycles. And I still think that the four-year cycles have worked out pretty well. I'll talk about that in another, another video. Uh... <laughs> Thanks. I got one person on my side. Uh, everyone is against regulation. We think we can fight it. It won't come. Well, you're dreaming because that's true. I agree with Rob. Let's get it over with. Let's rip the Band-Aid off. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> how is China banned something that's already banned? I'll tell you exactly how. Mark this. They're going to come out, one of the CCP newspapers, and they're going to say, there's going to be a crackdown on Bitcoin miners, and we're going to sweep across the nation, and we're going to find them, and we're going to shut them down with prejudice, and we're going to stop them from using the electricity for the, for the Chinese people because we've already banned it, and here it comes. That's how it's going to happen. They're not going to say ban. They're going to say crack down or some kind of derivative of whatever that term is. And it's going to scare people. And that's just how it is. So just be ready for it. Have your fresh powder on the sidelines. Bitcoin is zero. Money does make people salty. That's why I'm hoping for you guys can get some, what I call escape velocity. Escape velocity is where, I mean, some people might call it FU money, but I call it escape velocity. It sounds better. Escape velocity is like, well, I don't have to, you know, rely on a job. I can do my investments. I live off my investments. I have uh, residual income. That's the greatest. And uh, I've been doing that since 2015. 
uh, for my online businesses. And it's worked out pretty well. And that's what I hope for you to get at some point. It'll happen. It just takes a long time. Remember, uh, I'm an old guy. Uh, I got kids and grandkids. So like, it just took me a little bit of time. That's all. And I think if you're here right now, I think you're going to be well ahead of, of my time curve. That's what it is. All right. And this is a great question. Which do you foresee coming sooner? Better home prices or moving out of crypto winter? I, I think we'll probably move out of crypto winter first before the home prices will do better. Remember, uh, those interest rates are climbing. And as the interest rate rates climb, then the potential buyers are like, well, maybe it's not for me. Maybe I'll just rent for another year or so and then save up some money because they take a look at the, uh, the amortization table, which is all for your, for your payments. I think that's going to take a little bit more time. Also, there's also an issue with the supply. There's still a low amount of supply uh, for houses. And I've been, I'm even here in El Paso, I talked to a real estate agent a couple, a couple weeks ago and she said, yeah, it's, it's hard for us to get in because there's not as much supply. So what does that mean? That means that there's more construction going on. That means that of course the price of, uh, of lumber and nails and cement and everything else is still high. So it's still going to keep the, the cost up. So I don't think uh, that'll come down now. Crypto winter, get a little regulation and you know what? Get a spot ETF. And, and that'll change everything. Do I think the spot ETF is coming? Nope. But I would like to see it. Yeah, that's where me and that's where me and James do not agree at all. Oh yeah, I'm old. I still think you're in your 40s. I am in my 40s. But I am old. And the trick is to get in early. <laughs> all right. So let's see. I think that's it. Did I miss anything? Ah, okay, one more. Well, there's two more, and this is a good question. Do you think we need to look into Tether? I don't think we need to look into Tether. I think if this pa this passes, then the Congress will look into Tether. And then we can all fight, figure it out. We can all say, okay, well, it's fine because now we took a look at the financials. Now, there was an audit done by a company in the Caribbean, I want to say Bermuda, and uh, or maybe it was the Virgin Islands. They did an independent audit and found that it was backed fine by either cash or some kind of derivatives or some type of assets. They said it was good. So we'll see. Uh, so do we have to worry about Tether right now? No, I don't think so. Uh, unless an audit comes out by the government, government agencies go in there and say, where's it all at? And it's not there. But is that a guarantee? No, it's not. I just like using USDC. It just makes sense for me because uh, uh, Alistar, I've got the guys, the CEO, He's sat before Congress. He's submitted the paperwork and all the documents and said, this is how we are collateralized. And it is collateralized. So that's it. Uh, and I just, Des is older than me. Still making it, baby. Thanks, Devin. I appreciate you. Uh, Uh, I'll answer this. So Amazon FBA, that's a pretty easy business. Uh, do you believe what's the, the future of private label? So Amazon has, it's just like YouTube. It has an algorithm. And the way that they, you know, do things is just different, different setups that you can do and, and whatnot. So private label for right now, I don't think it's, it's, it's as uh, lucrative uh, as you might think, I think for like what I've always done is just, I can only tell you what I've done, which is I go to manufacturers. Well, I don't personally go. I ask them for their spreadsheets. What do you guys have? I run them through, through a program. I take a look at like an arbitrage and say, well, this is going to do pretty well, like yoga towels or whatever. This is going to do pretty well. I'll buy those at five bucks a piece. And then, you know, they make a profit because it's only three bucks a piece for them to produce it. And then of course I sell it on Amazon for 20 bucks, but Amazon takes their cut jerks. And then uh, I make so much, but I don't really have to do so much, but private label, actually getting your product and then just saying, okay, I'm going to strip off that yoga towels label of whatever, uh, namaste ink. I'm going to put my stamp on it. Digital asset news. You can do that, but it's just a lot more, a lot more work. And of course you have to make sure that yours, you, you find yourself in that algorithm. So where people actually find it as opposed to say, namaste yoga mat, because they have, uh, they've been there forever. Well, that went off the rails fast. Okay, that's it for everybody. So we're going about 40 minutes and uh, that's it for today. So look, 
everybody, thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate it. And I know it's, again, it seems like this is like the, the, the bad times, but it's all how you look at it. And I know that some people will say, hey, I was supposed to be a millionaire already. What the hell happened? Well, I thought the same thing in 2018. Now was the time to say, okay, I know there's an asymmetrical bet. Maybe this is the time to do that side hustle or to get some extra funds and to actually to invest. Because I got to tell you, if you're an investor right now, you are not like everybody else. A lot of people, they either waste their money or they have to use their money for living expenses. And if you're able to invest, I think now is the time. Just an opinion. All right. So that's it. So thanks so much, everybody. I do appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Adios.